Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your life coach, mentor coach. And what I do is I help people that are tired of who they are and where they are in life. And this is Gloria, your life coach. I help those who are feeling stuck, struggling with difficulties such as self-doubt, inner judgment, lack of confidence, life transitions, and taking steps forward. And welcome to Life's A Shuffle podcast. Now, you may wonder why it's called Life's A Shuffle. And the reason why we came up with this title was that life is really shuffling. And it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, what age you are, you're shuffling multiple things in life. And the best thing to know in life is everybody faces your struggles and everybody faces what you're going through. But there's hope in learning something about that. So when our guests share their journey, the hope is you learn something in that journey so yourself can navigate the struggles you face, the low self-esteem, the self-confidence. And that's why we call podcast Life's a Shuffle. And throughout this podcast, we share our personal overcoming stories, as well as our guests who shares their personal journey in overcoming their personal struggles. Life's a Shuffle podcast is here to connect like-minded individuals. And thank you for listening to Life's a Shuffle podcast. Hi, this is Gloria, life coach and meditation coach. Welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. Hi, this is Ronald Johnson, your mental health coach, and welcome to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. And you guys know, of course, we have to have guests on our podcast. We love to hear their stories and hope you guys love hearing their stories as well because, you know, authentic, being authentic is the best key to success. Being authentic is you love yourself more and being authentic is you show yourself more self-compassion. And we have a special guest all the way from Bay Area. His name is Derek. Derek, welcome to Life's a Shuffle podcast. So tell our fans who you are and where you're from. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah. So basically, my name is Derek King. I was actually born in New Jersey, um, lived there for two years. Then I relocated to Asia, where I spent time in Beijing, Hong Kong, and Shanghai um, through a course of like 10 years, uh, basically because my parents relocated there. And, um, you know, for me, I've always kind of identified as a basketball player growing up. And that was like a big focal point for me. Um, I actually moved back to the U.S., when I was about 14, so a sophomore in high school. And that's kind of when I realized like, oh, okay, maybe I could play um, basketball in college and I could just, you know, see how far I could go with it. But um, yeah, you know, that was always a goal of mine. And, um, you know, I'm of Asian American descent, so there's not many Asian Americans in the college basketball world, especially at the division one level. So being able to have um, accomplished my goal of playing collegiately at UC Berkeley, getting my degree um, as an Asian American, and also getting the chance and opportunity to play professionally for three years afterwards was uh, was a, a dream come true. Um, you know, in high school, I was actually a really bad student. I had like a 2.6 GPA. I mean, that's not terrible, but, um, you know, I had a lot of people, like, basically in my life, you know, looking back, if, if I would have told them, like, yeah, I'm going to go to UC Berkeley and, and play basketball, they probably would have laughed in my face. But I think my story is just one of one that can inspire others um, to, you know, ch- chase their dreams. And, you know, despite how things might play out, just to keep pushing forward. And you never know um, how things are going to play out in the end. Because to be honest, um, my goal was never was to play Division One, but it kind of got sidetracked. I didn't think it was possible at a certain point because I went to a prep school after high school, where I was basically trying to get recruited. I got to an NAIA school, which is just a different conference, uh, but not as uh, good competition. I, I would say as NCAA. And then I went to a junior college. Um, you know, faced some hardship there. wasn't sure if I was going to make it out of there. I, I told the coach when I came in, when they were recruiting me, like my goal was to earn a division two scholarship. And, you know, as time went on and and things kind of just ran their course, um, really blessed to have gotten the opportunity to have a spot on the UC 
men's basketball team at UC Berkeley, um, along with a few other offers as well. But it took me like four or five years after um, high school to, uh, to even you know get to that point. So it's definitely one of just not giving up and just determination, um, you know, especially come from where I came from, you know, no one would have thought that was going to happen. So just never giving up and just really would never have imagined in my wildest dreams that I would have ended up playing at Cal, but uh, it, it, was, it was a cool experience. Wow. Four or five years is, sounds pretty long, right? But I bet that four or five years was, that's a challenge and some kind of a journey that you went through there. Yeah, absolutely. Like I actually also repeated my freshman year in high school. Um, you know, I really wasn't a good student. I was very like, I, I ha also have ADHD. So I guess to all the people out there that have some mental, you know, health disorders or whatever, I, I, I get very sidetracked really easily. There's a million things going on in my brain all at once. And, you know, it was kind of, a reflection of my schoolwork because I wasn't very good in school, but the things that I was passionate about, the things that I cared about, I put forth a lot of effort into. And um, yeah, like, so I, I repeated a year of uh, my freshman year of high school. So that put me a year back. After high school, I took a gap year to play basketball at a prep school called La Jolla Prep, which has now gone on under right now. Uh, it went out of business, but it was basically a corrupt program where the, the coach there was, was, um, stealing money from the parents basically uh, we were like in two houses and then eventually got evicted from one house and we all got put into one house we couldn't afford gym time to practice it was like a crazy year we had to like we we're supposed to fly to idaho for a tournament and then we ended up just driving a crazy small van with like 12 guys just stuff them in there for like 13 hours like crazy stuff and then um you know i went to junior college after and as an asian american going to junior college is is often frowned upon frowned upon um but yeah all these obstacles you know i had to go through eventually led me to one of the best public universities in the world and a uh, very competitive basketball team as well where we had multiple nba players uh on my team you know jabari bird ivan rab um all of a lot of other pros that are now playing in europe as well um and myself i got to play over in asia and, you know, we got to play the likes of Lonzo Ball, uh, DeAndre Ayton, Markel Fultz. So a lot of other NBA players that were in the Pac-12 at the same time and just getting to travel and make really good relationships. Um, it was really awesome. Yeah. So uh, I'm, I'm curious. So you were born in Jersey and then you went to um, Asia. What part of Asia did you go? Did you go to? So I from New Jersey, I moved to Hong Kong. I lived in Hong Kong for like eight years until I was about 10. Then I moved to Beijing, moved to Beijing, lived there for three years. Then, you know, because I was so bad in school and all that, um, my parents, well, my mom at the time, I was just was my single mom. She decided to send me to a boarding school because she felt like she couldn't really control me. Um, and so I went to an all boys boarding school in Connecticut called Avon Old Farms. Um, and I absolutely hated it. It was like a school where you had to wear a suit every single day. You had six days of school a week, so Monday through Saturday. Um, and it was an all-boys boarding school in the middle of nowhere in Connecticut. So I, I, I was just really hating that. I uh, was homesick. Just terrible year for me. But uh, definitely, uh, you know, learned a lot from it. It definitely played a, far, uh, a factor as far as, like, who I am today. It definitely played a part. Um, yeah. But yeah, after that year, I moved to Shanghai, China, where I actually got to uh, go to a boarding school in China. My dad was living in Shanghai at the time. So like originally, I thought I was gonna be living with him. But then eventually, he was traveling a lot for work. So he eventually just put me in an apartment by myself. So I lived by myself as a 14 year old. in oh, Shanghai. Right. Um, so that was really cool. Uh, I got to you know, go to school. But at the same time, Shanghai is such a crazy city. And I was a big kid. I was like 6'2 as a 14 year old. And my three best friends were actually seniors at the time, because it was a small little, like private, um, private school, but basically very like conservative, like Taiwanese kids, uh, Asian kids, like that are more conservative. And I definitely just stuck stuck out like a sore thumb. So I had like three friends that were like seniors, 
that kind of just showed me the ropes and they were taking me to like clubs and like nightlife even on the weekdays and stuff like that so all this was such a shock to me and i hadn't like my own apartment but um yeah it was it was wild it was definitely way too much for a 14 year old kid but looking back i definitely had some good memories but um yeah it was uh it definitely, you know, reflected in my schoolwork. I, I did not do well in school that year. Um, you know, I was just not focused. But as far as like learning life skills and like learning how to, you know, just have some street smarts and things of that nature, that really helped a lot. But yeah, my dad gave me basically 300 kwai, 300 renminbi a week. That's like the Chinese currency. Yeah, that's not a lot of money. That's like, I want to say like, uh, maybe a little like 60, 70, 70 bucks a week um, to live like for food and stuff like that. So I learned how to budget my money. Like when I first was up by myself, you know, I would spend all that money in the first two days and have nothing left for the rest of the week. And, you know, I still remember the days where like I, w- I would have my friends bring food from their house to lunchtime so I could have food to eat. Um, I remember, you know, just going to restaurants and like, ordering in china like if you just want to if you're eating with others and you just order like a bowl of rice they'll usually just give that to you for free and then what i would do is i would just order a bowl of rice and then order a a fried egg for like one kwai which is like maybe 25 cents so that would be my meal like that would be like a go-to meal i'd get rice and then like two eggs like just to save money um but yeah it was a crazy year and then you know this was all while i was 14 years old 13 14 and then I moved to California after that to be back with my mom. She, you know, she found out that I was living by myself. She thought that was crazy, which it probably was in, in hindsight. But uh, yeah, I moved. I got uprooted. I was basically forced to move to America, um, and I wasn't happy about that because my whole life, every all my friends, everything I knew was in China. Um, and I moved to the U.S. I was forcibly moved to the U.S. where I knew nobody. Um, as as a you know, young kid, new school, new everything, new world. Um, and, you know, I wasn't happy. I actually, um, yeah, just, you know, we, we butt heads a lot, me and my mom. And uh, actually, it got to a point where, like, I thought I was going to, I thought I was going to get to at least go back home. Because I, like, they thought, they, they told me, oh, I'm going to go to, to California just to help my mom move in. Because she was moving to California and, you know, I would just be a summer vacation two weeks. But I didn't know that there was no return ticket for me back to Shanghai. So I came and, you know, they said, hey, you're not going back. And uh, but then eventually in the middle of summer, like they said, all right, well, at least you'll be able to uh, at least you'll be able to, you know, go back, get all your things. Because I only had packed two weeks worth of stuff. They'll be like, you can go back, get your things, and, um, you know, just say bye to your friends at least. So I, I was kind of clinging on to that. But midway through the summer, I guess, someone convinced my mom. They were like, hey, you know, if you let your son do that, he's not coming back. So then my mom changed her mind, and, you know, she's like, yeah, you're not going back at all, period. And, you know, that was, uh, that w- that was really hard on me. And, you know, I had like an outburst, you know, I was like punching holes in the wall and, you know, I I went crazy and my mom actually called the cops and I actually spent the night in jail in in juvie, I should say. So, yeah, definitely had some low lows in my life. Um, My mom and I butt butt heads a lot. And this is all, you know, before I even turned 15, I think. So it it, it was, it was a lot. I actually haven't really even told that many people that, um, but uh, yeah, you know, I did that and then, you know, moved to the U.S. and slowly started getting acclimated with the culture, started to make new friends. The one thing that kind of helped me was, you know, my love for basketball. And, you know, I quickly made friends with a lot of the guys on the team at Santa Teresa High School where, where I went. And, you know, that's where I also met Mike Allen, who was uh, kind of like a coach slash trainer for me, who really helped, like, develop my game and, you know, give me some confidence as a young kid. Um, and yeah, I just kept going with it, never stopped. And, you know, eventually achieved my, my goals of playing professionally and in division one. 
Wow. That's, <laughs> that sure is a lot for a teenager. I'm, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, oh my God. I mean, I have a 14 year old now. I think I can't imagine, I can't even imagine someone that young to go through so much like that. And even just living on your own. Yeah. No, you know? it was crazy. That, that is just some crazy life. And, and then I guess your passion now for, for basketball is kind of like what helped you turn your life around. Yeah, I would say basketball was definitely a, a focal point in my life that kept me focused, gave me a goal to you know play in college, and it was a good outlet for me, um, definitely. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, man. It seems like I, w- I would say this. Let's, let's say congratulations on the fact that you made it. Mm-hmm. I mean, because a 14-year-old kid, I've never been to China, so I have no idea what it looks like at all. But just trying to manage money, trying to survive, you still got to wash your clothes. You know, it, it's just, you're able to do all that and make it, make friends. And it, it's, it's correct me if I'm wrong, it seems like your mom lived in the States, your dad lived in, in China, and they were separated. Is that how yeah. it worked or, or what? Yeah, they were divorced. So while I was in China, actually, my mom was in India. So she was in India. She was working for Cisco Systems, and they had her in India. So, and I was in Shanghai with my dad. Well, I was supposed to be, but um, and I was by myself in Shanghai. And then, and then when my mom got the opportunity to relocate to California and be like at headquarters in San Jose, that's kind of when she was like, "All right, yeah, Derek, uh, it's summer vacation now. Why don't you come here for two weeks and um, you know just help me get settled into my new house." blah, blah, see me. And then, yeah, there was no return ticket. But yeah, I mean, when I was by myself, like in Shanghai, I remember like on weekdays, we would just go out all night, never even sleep and just like stay out all night, take the subway to school, which was like a 45 minute subway ride. So we'd we'd go out until the subway opened in the morning, like 530 in the morning, take the subway to school. And then I hadn't slept yet at all, and I would just be in school. Oh my god! And like just sleeping in the classroom. Like I was gonna say, like I, I had to hear the story. So tell me some crazy stories like that are kind of funny. You look back, say, "Man, I, I can't believe I, I, I made it." Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's definitely one of them right there. You know, just um, and just just the wild stuff I had to go through. You know, living in China on my own. Um, also, like just. How about spending, dating? Yeah. All, all those times, like just all that time by myself, not having the food, you know what I mean? Not not being able to, you know, basically there was no one there to tell me to brush my teeth, to to do my homework or do it. It was just basically a free for all. So I kind of just had to learn things the hard way, or, you know what I mean? Um, so it was it was cool, but um, you know, I I enjoyed it. I I loved my time in Shanghai. Like it, looking back, it was so much fun. But um, probably not the best best thing for a normal fourteen year old. But looking back, I definitely wouldn't have changed a thing. You were enjoying your freedom. Yeah, it was it was a lot yeah. of freedom. Um, yeah, especially for a city like Shanghai, where it is a nice city, but you know, you're able to leverage public transportation you're able to take the subway you're able to take little motorcycle taxis for really cheap you can get around the whole city you know be totally fine take taxis so um you know i I got to know shanghai like the back of my hand and actually made friends with a lot like there after you get out of the subway station usually you still have like a, a little bit of a ride to get to your next destination so there would be a lot of like motorcycles that were just like freelance taxis basically back in the day where they would just be waiting outside of the subway station. And I actually made friends with a few of them and like, I would have their numbers in my phone. And sometimes I would literally just like call them and they'd meet me downstairs and they'd take me to wherever I want to go. So I would just be like on the back of some random guy's motorcycle in in China. But yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. I'm curious. I'm I'm curious though. Is this, um, I I just want to know if this is something normal maybe in Asia to have, um, you know, someone at such a young age to, for them to be on their own or, or be more in teaching them to be more independent, I would say maybe. No, I don't think my, I don't think it's that normal. Um, like for me, that was never the plan. I was supposed to live with my dad and then, and and then they, I, they, they 
put me into this school that was supposed to be a boarding school. So I was there actually living on campus. But then there's like another funny story, actually. So I got actually expelled from the, the, the boarding school. Um, so oh, that's, that's okay. Why I, that's why I had to live by myself. So I wasn't expelled from the school. I was just expelled from the dorms because it was like, it's actually kind of a funny story. Um, like there was one day. So like our dorms were like in a building that was like right next to the school. And where I lived was like on the fifth floor. So about like 50 feet in the air, maybe 60 feet in the air. And we all had dorms right next to each other. So me and then like my friends that were seniors, they were like in the dorms next to mine and the, and the one after. And one day I locked my key in my own dorm room so I couldn't get in. But I was also late for basketball practice. Um, I didn't want to kick the door down. And what the seniors did all the time is – if they lock their key in their room, if you actually go into the room, there's a window, you could actually open it and climb out. And there's an air conditioning vent on that's like basically re- like resting outside the window. And they're symmetrical like on every single room. So they they would climb out of their window and then just hop onto the next air conditioning vent and then walk through the window of the next room to get in to get access to the next room. And I see them do that like a million times. So I was like, all right, well, today I'm going to just do that, right? So I went into my friend's room. I did the same thing. As soon as I climbed out of the window and I looked down, I was like, oh, my gosh. Like, I'm so high in the air right now. And, like, I got scared. So I actually got got the courage to jump to the next window, which was my room. And then I was sitting on this little concrete block, like about 60 feet up in the air. And uh, my window was actually locked. So my window was locked too. So my window was locked and my door was locked. And now I'm stuck 60 feet in the air. And I was, I was, I overestimated how easy it was for me to do it. Like it, the, the concrete block that I was on was so small that I was scared to like shimmy back and like go back to where I came from and jump back onto the original one that I was on and go back into the other room. Cause it was so small. I, I thought I was going to slip. So I, I just stayed where I was. I was too scared to go back. So I just stayed right on that, that concrete block. And like, I, I, I remember to this day, like, you know, there was bikers on, on the street, like looking at me They probably thought I was trying to commit suicide or something. They were like, Oh my gosh, what's that guy doing? Um, but yeah, I had my phone with me luckily. And I, you know, I had to call the dorm lady. She had like the master key obviously. And she was in the middle of like a, a staff meeting and you know i told her i was like hey you know i'm i'm outside of my window like and she's like what do you mean you're outside of your window i'm like no i'm actually stuck on the air conditioning that I, I was trying to get in but my window is actually locked too and then she's like are you kidding me are you insane so she like rushed back like in the middle of her meeting and then like opened my door and, and thankfully saved me let me go back into that into the room like unharmed but she she was like this is unbelievable this is crazy you could have died and ever since that day, I was expelled from the dorms. Um, and then, uh, and then, yeah. So then my dad was like, all right, well, you can live in this other, she, he had like a vacant apartment. So I, I just lived there. Um, and because it was closer to the school and, uh, and then from that point on, I was just by myself. So to answer your question, I know that's a long answer. I don't think that's normal, but my circumstance was just so abnormal that it just kind of led to that. I got it. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's that's a crazy story. I, I even, I'm I'm so like almost a nobody. I'm like, how did he get back? I'm trying to picture how's it looking. So I know in bigger cities, everything's high rise, right? So everything's straight up. So everything has to be symmetrical, right? Exactly. Thinking, yeah. And how did he make you, it? If you, if you could just imagine, if you open every window, there's like a little air conditioning vent from the room below you. That's kind of like a concrete block. There's like two concrete blocks that kind of like cover the air conditioning vent so right on top of the air conditioning vent there's like a concrete block and every single room had that attachment so that's what i was kind of on crazy wow man you need to write a book (laughs) (laughs) and it it seems you know i I could be wrong i do apologize um culturally most asian people's parents stay together right so it was your situation completely different or outside the normal yeah um i mean i'm not sure about the like like the divorce rate for Asian families, but uh, 
Yeah, you know, I think a lot of Asian families try to stay together, but mine was definitely different. I spent time living with my mom, and then I spent a little bit of time with my dad, but then I spent a lot of time, like, kind of by myself, too. Um, but, yeah, when I moved back to the States, I was back with my mom. So that was that was definitely a big adjustment, you know, from going back to having, like, rules and, and things like that um, is from coming – from like a place where I basically could do whatever I want. Um, so that was an adjustment for sure. Yeah. yeah. So I say it went from a free for all to now uh -huh. you got, you got you do your dishes, you got to do your homework, you got to brush your teeth. You got to have a curfew, right? Yeah, exactly. That is a structure. Exactly. That combined with the fact that I didn't even want to be there to begin with, like she kind of forced me there. So it was a lot of conflict, you know, with me and my mom. But uh, I think looking back now, I can, I can appreciate that it was probably the best thing for me at the time. You know, I hated it. Uh, I, I didn't didn't want to be in the States. I didn't know anyone there. But, you know, if I never moved to the States, I probably would have never played at, at Cal. I probably would have never got my degree um, from one of the best schools in the country. I probably would have never played professionally. So, you know, you never know how things are going to play out. So it's, it's, it's funny how these, like, little events in life can kind of lead to things that don't make sense at the time but looking back you can kind of appreciate yeah, yeah once you start connecting once you start reflecting reflecting in life actually ron and i was talking about that earlier once you start reflecting in life and you talk about it and you start connecting the dots if things make sense for you now absolutely yeah, yeah. things that you were just like wow like that's not something that I liked at all. It wasn't pleasant at all. But, you know, if it weren't for that one event, it's kind of like the butterfly effect. It's like if that didn't happen, then that wouldn't have happened, which led to that. And, you know, it's it's the whole thing. It's like uh, I call it the domino effect. Um, you know, there's a story I read and uh, it's in a book called Atomic Habits. By, I think James Clear, I don't know if you ever listened or read the book, but he describes how things, just a minute change can change the trajectory. So the example he gives is that there's a flight going from San Jose to New York, right? And obviously the flight knows how to, the, the flight um, pilot knows how to get there. It's on autopilot or whatever, right? All it takes if you to change one degree and you could end up in North Carolina, just one degree off, mm -hmm. you can live in a different city. So that change was perpetual in everything else because going to best school, meeting Mike Allen and all this stuff, if that didn't happen, even though it was uncomfortable at the time, you wouldn't be where you are today, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Yeah, that to totally definitely applies to my life, and I'm sure many people's lives as well. Yeah, so you were diagnosed with, is it ADD or ADHD? ADHD. ADHD. Okay. My question is, when were you diagnosed? I was actually diagnosed when I was like, I want to say eight or nine. And I remember, you know, I still remember like going into like this psychiatrist's office it made me do a bunch of like tests with like a bunch of like patterns and like some numbers and they would like they had a few interviews with me and i remember the day like i was sitting in a doctor's office with my mom and they were like yeah like so your son has what we call adhd it's like attention deficit hyper something disorder mm -hmm. and then like they told my mom and me and i i had no idea what was going on i was like an eight-year-old kid i was just like hella distract i was like distracted i was like just thinking things were fine and then I remember we left the doctor's office and we were in like this corridor where there was like elevators um waiting to go down because we we're in a high-rise building this is in Hong Kong and after we left that doctor's office where he said like oh yeah your son has ADHD I remember like my mom just started crying like in the middle of the the corridor and I was like mom why are you crying like what's going on like I didn't know what was going on I was just like an eight-year-old like happy kid like just like I didn't know what ADHD was, and then I was, and I it just stuck with me. She's like, "Hmm, why are you crying?" Like, and then she's like, "Oh, nothing, nothing." And it, to this day, I still remember that. And like, yeah, I, I remember in school afterwards, like during lunchtime, like the nurse would come into to my class and like give me like pills to like take to help me focus. And I remember being on those pills throughout middle school and high school. Uh, I stopped taking them after a while, but um, yeah, that, that's kind of like my story with ADHD. Awesome. I got a question. I, I'm kind of curious, right? Because um, I work in the mental health space. 
So you got diagnosed, which is great because some people never get diagnosed or diagnosed way later in life. You got the medication. Did it help you? And my other question is, I'm going to do a, a combo kind of question. Is a school system set up for kids to have those, to have that disorder? Yeah, so I was going to school in Asia at the time. Um, so I can't really speak for the school system here in the U.S. But uh, I do think that the medication did help me focus in school and stuff like that. Um, I remember just like being able to like blow through a whole project that I procrastinated on. And then once I took the pills, I could just sit down for like six hours straight, like undistracted and just knock something out, like, um, and just stay focused, which is something like, you know, with me, like a doctor, like would often tell me like my brain is like, like a Ferrari engine, but stuck in like a normal car like sedan like and then i'm just always like like they, they would always say like to give me something to fiddle with like uh like there was like a squishy ball like to say like during like lectures or like in class and stuff you can kind of play with the ball to kind of like give your mind something to focus on so you can like be present um but yeah i wasn't very diligent with my medication like i after a certain age i just stopped taking it because School to me was never really uh, an area of interest for me. So like, even though it did help me in school, I didn't really care enough about school to want to take it every day because I was focused on basketball. So, uh, but I would say it, it, it did help um, as far as like focusing and stuff like that. Is the school system set up for someone that has that diagnose, the diagnosis? So out in in Asia is very rigorous. So I would say, uh, you know, if you have ADHD and you're, you're not aware that you have it, um, it's, it could be very overwhelming. I remember like days where I would just procrastinate and just let things pile up and just like, just compound like, Oh my gosh, I have like this much work I have to do in like a week or in a day even. And you know, that's not ideal. But when I moved to the States, um, the workload here was so much less than overseas in Asia um, that oh, it was manageable. But um, yeah, I would say the school system here is, I mean, to me, I'm not a really big fan of the school system. Like, I just feel like we're taught a bunch of stuff that we don't really need. Um, I don't, I have strong opinions about that. Um, I know it's not very conventional, but at the end of the day, like, I think, you know, if you take the medication and if you do have the diagnosis, it, it's beneficial to take it if you want to, you know, focus and do well in school. Excellent. I, I want to know the difference. Um, Cause I know I've, I've heard stories about how you said, you know, Asia, it's, it's highly competitive. It's very rigorous. Even from the day you can start school, it's very rigorous. And in the States, it's a little bit different. And I kind of, um, I resonate with you is um, I think our school system is really out to date and broken in a lot of different ways. And I have a strong, a strong opinion about that. Um, I definitely understand that teachers nowadays have so much pressure on them more than ever before. There's, there's no funding for schools. There's no, it's just really not what we need. And um, so I, I just, I'm very opinionated about the fact that I think our system is broken. It, we spend a lot of time, a lot of our time not understanding how to build personal self-confidence, self-esteem, or we're not taught how to, you know, manage credit. You know, how do you, how do you ask for a pay raise? How do you do stocks? You know, life skills that are going to be forever. Like, yeah. you know, how do you, how do you raise a family? Like Absolutely. you don't learn that. Yeah. So, I mean, you learn that obviously by doing it and figuring out what works, but you just not taught life skills. And I think it should be more focused on that, you know, how to regulate your body through stress. Absolutely. You know, I mean, I remember back in kindergarten, whatever grade it was at the time, um, taking a spelling bee test. And I got to remember 30 words, how to spell them correctly. It's, I'm stressed. Like, oh my God, I don't want to get an F. I want to get A plus, you know, and all that stuff like that. So um, I think then that's what I know now, but I didn't know then. I'm a very visual learner. So for me, um, I was actually in special programs growing up in, in school. Um, I forgot my diagnosis. It's too long ago for me to remember, but pretty much I was giving... Um, extra time on tests and exams because I actually flunked kindergarten. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my parents weren't together, some things are going on, and um, I flunked kindergarten. You would think, well, are you doing this coloring and sleeping? But it happened, right? Mm -hmm. So, 
you know, um, I was getting extra time because I had a learning disability at that time. And um, it was really hard for me to learn certain things like grammar, punctuation, writing. It's extraordinarily hard for me. I, I have writing anxiety to the point I get paralyzed. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just avoid it. Um, so that's what I'm saying. It's broken. That's my, my opinion about that. But fast forward, like you're six two. Did you get past six two, or did you get to six seven? Or are you seven foot now? Well, what's going on? I'm about six three now. Oh man, you're tall. Yeah, you are. <laughs> All than now me. You, <laughs> you know that. Um, I mean, being Asian myself, it's, it's six six three. That's super tall for being Asian. Yeah. And um, it's yeah, it, it's rare. It's also rare. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Tell us how did um. I'm really curious. Um, how did basketball, why basketball and how did Mike Allen change your life? Yeah. So basketball, you know, that was just, like I said, I was actually a soccer player at first and that was like kind of my passion. I wanted to be a professional soccer player at a young age, but it's just all of my friends started playing basketball. So like at lunchtime, you know, we go back to sixth, seventh grade, everyone just started playing basketball. I'm like, all right, well, I want to play basketball too then just because all my friends are doing it. And then just naturally, I got really good, really fast. Um, and when I thought, when I said I was good, I was good compared to my friends, like in China. And then when I moved to the U.S., you know, the the level of competition here was a little higher. And you know, it just naturally felt like something I could be good at. And um, you know, with Mike, Mike Allen, um, when I first saw him, I was just a young kid that didn't really know much. Like I had skills and like raw ability. But he really helped to refine those skills and mentor me and just instill that confidence in me because I was a young kid, you know, a lot of young kids, like, even if they're talented, they don't even know how good they are themselves. But just to hear it from, you know, an older person, someone like Mike, who's played professionally as well, who was a really good college player, you know, has been a coach for a while, just hearing it from a guy like that was just so powerful. Um, and just instilling that confidence in me as a young young kid was was huge. Um, so yeah, he really helped to elevate my level to to the next level. I remember him; he would he would drive to my house, and pick me up in the morning before school. He would be at my house at five thirty in the morning, um, you know. And he gets nothing out of this, you know. He he drives to my house, picks me up. It's it's all dark out, it's freezing cold. Drives me to the gym. He's out there helping me, you know, rebounding for me. Um, and you know, I have nothing to offer him, you know, he's just doing this out of the goodness of his heart because he saw something, he saw some ability in me and wanted to just help me. And, you know, I, I appreciate that looking back, these are the things that you can't really put a price tag on. Like, it's just like priceless for a young boy to have that support from, from someone, um, is, is, is huge. So I, I definitely appreciate Mike a lot. Yeah, looking at Mike, he seems like he would above beyond a normal coach. I mean, when I think my coaches back in middle school or high school is just you show up to practice and sayonara, right? You really get that personal touch. If you look back in your experience with Mike, um, I'm, I'm just curious. Um, what did he see in you you did not see in yourself? I guess, you know, he really just helped me just believe in myself. Even though I did believe in myself, like, he like doubled down on it and he, you know, he helped me because it wasn't necessarily a physical thing with me that you know, I, I lacked skills or whatever, like, which I did. I mean, obviously there's always room for improvement. Even to this day, I can improve in so many ways. Um, but, you know, so much of basketball and, and many things in life are just about having that self-belief and that, that confidence. Um, and that was that part of the, of the game was really huge for for him and for me um so just instilling that in me um to allow me to play to the best of my potential um was huge because before i knew how good i was i would often you know just play passively or defer to other players but you know he instilled that confidence in me to be able to play through mistakes make make aggressive mistakes um you know to always try to be aggressive but not do too much just to be yourself but not passive um so i think that that was you know 
big for him. Wow. I would say that um, he really did something, see something in you. He saw a really good potential in you. And so he really took that time to be, you were, to him, I would say what it seems like to me is not only he's an athlete, but also like treated you like a son. Yeah. Yeah, he did. And, you know, I, I grew up without a dad, basically. So um, that was big because there I didn't really have that father figure to kind of, you know, show me what a man's supposed to be like. And I would say I have a few of those figures in my life, and, and Mike's definitely one of them. Um, but a lot of that's, like, you know, contributed to a lot of, like, I could, you could call them insecurities or, or whatever even when it comes to like just everyday life um, and, you know, just having guys like Mike um, out there. Cause I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of guys like me that grew up without a father. Um, and, and that was, that was monumental for sure. Yeah. Or girls that grew up without a father yeah. also. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what life skills did he teach you? It seemed like he taught you something that's perpetual. Like he taught you something in life. He taught you something, even though it was basketball related, but did he teach you life skills? Because it seemed like there was a correlation there. Yeah, and and um, to touch on with that um, with that question is what he said. What life skills? So what is that that stuck with you to these days? Yeah, I would say you know with Coach Mike, he's always been uh, very like he he's he's a man of God. Like he would say, like he's he's a Christian. He's a devoted Christian. And he would always try to instill that in in his players. And not only me, like after our workouts, he would give out quotes for every workout. Um, you know, he just really instilled that work ethic, that hard work, that motivation, um, you know, pushing through adversity, I would say, is is a large thing for him, for me as well, that, that I got from him. Because like, you know, as a sophomore coming in, it's not like I was a superstar. I was actually a bench player. I didn't play a whole lot. Um, junior year, same thing. Didn't play a whole lot. You know, average five points a game my junior year, which isn't that impressive or anything. But, you know, uh, he just told me to stay the course, not get too high, not get too low. And, you know, senior year when my opportunity presented itself, I, I was able to become first team all league selection. I averaged like 18 points a game. I was, uh, you know, one of the best players on our team. And, you know, it, it was pushing through that adversity that allowed me to, like, reap the fruits of my, that, that, I, that I, you know, put forth. Um, and that's kind of a, a common theme in my life um, because, you know, I've always had to face adversity, kind of climb to the top and then, you're knocked all the way down to the rock bottom and you have to climb all the way to the top again and, and fight through that. Like I said, you know, after high school, it wasn't like, Oh wow, you played really well your senior year. Let's just get you a scholarship right away to division one. Like, no, I had to go to a prep school. Like I said, deal with all the evictions and, you know, the, the fraud and I had to go to a junior college for two years, you know, and then, you know, after that, adversity that hardship i got to get to cal and, and play there but even when i got to cal there was more adversity right i had to i had to you know i wasn't playing a whole lot there you know and, and it's a common theme in my life even to this day there's always going to be that stress that hardship that adversity and mike is a very big proponent of like you know fighting through that with enthusiasm embracing that adversity and overcoming that adversity and, and I know Mike's going through some some hardship now so it means a lot for me to kind of help bring light to his story and you know just share who he is as a person genuinely um, and you know just it's meaningful for me to be able to help him especially someone that's helped me so much yeah I felt that too um, I don't know if you know but Gloria and I did uh, um, virtual um coaching kind of uh workshop um recently we used the proceeds to help mike allen mike allen out as well because he just was a, a person that just hit you know, rock bottom Absolutely. and um you know and we did whatever we could to make sure we give back to people that hit rock bottom and they're trying to get up like he's trying to get up 
And sometimes, you know, I give my clients analogy. You know, if you've seen a movie, there's one guy on a cliff and one guy reaching down for help, right? Because he's going to fall. But, so, you know, in Mike's case, he's reaching up and he needs people to reach down and help him up, right? Get to the next you know, plateau, then help him get to the next plateau because mm -hmm. hum, it's a humbling guy. He gives back. He has amazing quotes and uh, he's extremely authentic. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah and it, it's just seeing where he came from, too, because when I was in high school and Mike was training me and stuff like that, I always looked at Mike in the highest light. Like, into this day, I still do. Obviously, he's going through some hard times, but, you know, he had a, a very thri a thriving business, you know, hundreds of kids he would help. He had a nice big house in the Bay Area, you know, very nice family and all that. And, you know, just to see where he's been and where he's he's at now, it, it, it is humbling because, you know, he had it all. And, uh, you know, it's it, it hurts me to kind of see where he's at now. But. You know, I know he can, he can fight and, and push through and and get back to where he was. Hopefully, hope so too. Hope so too. So, Derek faced a lot of adversity. Where are you now in your life? Yeah. So now in my life, you know, I've I've played basketball professionally for three years. Um, so after that, I transitioned into basically tech sales. So I started my corporate career off at a company called Arango DB, where we were basically selling uh, a multi-model database solution. So it was a very technical product. Um, and that's basically an entry level role for tech sales there. I spent a little over a year and a half there. And, and now I tra I'm transitioning over into, uh, well, my current job now is uh, account executive at a cybersecurity company called Dark Trace. Um, so now instead of setting up qualified meetings for account executives, I am the account executive that facilitates the whole sales cycle, prospects, gets a, a client into a meeting, presents a deck and a demo, a technical demo, coordinates all the technical contacts from our end, um, provide resources for 30-day free trials and eventually try to close some deals as well. So I'm, I'm doing that at the moment. And um, I'm also, you know, really big on cryptocurrency. That's definitely a new area of passion for me. Um, and and I, we touched upon this earlier, how we said the school system is broken. And I couldn't agree more with you, right? Like learning how to invest your money, learning about credit, learning about taxes and all these things. Like, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're, we're not taught that, right? The system isn't the monetary system, the banking system isn't designed for the masses to know that it's it's corrupt. So this is an area of, of interest that has really, you know, been like blossoming, I guess you could say, in, in the last couple of years. I'm just stepping into that world, trying to put as much money to my name as possible to work for me instead of just sitting in a bank losing my value, basically. Um, so, you know, I'm doing that. And then also I have a, a barbering business that I'm about to open um, here in South San Jose. Um, we're, we're planning on opening in December. So things are moving quick. We just signed a lease agreement uh, in early October, um, ordered a bunch of chairs from China. Uh, we were getting, you know, flooring, we're painting the walls and just building this business from the ground up and I'm doing it with a business partner as well. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. It should be a really nice shop here in, in the South Bay. So yeah, I got a lot of moving parts at the moment, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about it. Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to hear that story, um, you know, from, um, adversity to triumph, pretty much, right? You, you figured out what you can do using your skills and talents to to actually support you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, I don't want it to seem like I'm some huge success story because I definitely face a lot of hardships and adversity to this day. Um, you know, um, so yeah, it's it's a constant battle. You know, there's always like I, that stress and that hardship. I think. Is, is a constant in my life. And I think it's not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's without that, you can't really enjoy the, the, uh, the blessings as much, you know, it gives you that perspective and it gives you that, um, perspective when you're able to overcome those hardships and it makes you that much more appreciative of, you know, when you get those 
small successes. Yeah, it really does. It does. And that's how, um, that's who makes you because it's how you navigate through that adversity or how, just how you navigate through any challenges or obstacles in life. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, um, like I said, you, you, you just really never know how things are going to play out. And while you're going through it, it might seem overwhelming, but you just keep pushing forward. You, like, you, you could be surprised, like some amazing things could happen in your life. So true. So true. You know what? As we get towards the end of our podcast, I want to say first, Derek, thank you for sharing your story. Um, it resonated with me on a lot of different levels, emotionally, physically, and makes me feel humble where I'm at my in my life today. And I hope for those out there that hear your story, we like realize, man, I'm an Asian American too. If he did it, I can do it kind of attitude. And I always ask my clients, not clients, sorry. I always ask my guests. I'm so used to saying we're client, I apologize. Sure. I ask my um, guests, what is one to five sentence as a takeaway for those that will listen to this podcast, you can say? I would say... There was one thing I thought of that I, I, I forgot to mention, and I think this is this could be important for all the people that are listening, like for all the parents out there that might be having some kids with some mental disorders or ADHD or ADD, or they're maybe struggling in school, um, you know, just to not not lose hope, you know, give them that positive encouragement. Because, you know, with me, you know, I, I felt like when I was a kid, there was a lot of times my parents were almost embarrassed of me. Like, Oh my gosh, like this guy is like struggling. You know, he's all his peers are, you know, doing so well in school. He's falling behind and everything. He's repeating ninth grade. He's getting expelled out of the dorms. He's getting kicked out here. He's going to juvie. You know what I mean? Like just to not lose hope on, on your kid because everybody has gifts in their own way and to just give them that support um, and just know that, you know, like I said, it's, I've said it throughout the podcast. It's just, you really never know how, th how things are going to play out. And although I've overcome a lot of these obstacles and, and hurdles, um, it, none of that would have been possible without the support of people like Mike or like my mom or like, you know, many other adults or not even just adults, but just positive figures in my life. Um, so I would say just to not give up on, on, on kids that might be struggling, especially the parents, not, you know, and, and, uh, you know, to use your network and really just try to be creative in, in the ways you approach these obstacles and adversity. I love that. That I is so that. true. Don't give up. Keep moving forward. That's mm -hmm. how winning is done. Absolutely. And I, I, yes. I, I do love that too. And also just to let you know, we do have a lot of youth um, listeners on our podcast that, that follows us and are constant listeners on this. And I think that this would really, um, I know that your story resonates with a lot of them. And this is very inspiring story to, you know, most especially a lot of the youth these days who might be going through the same challenges that you had or, um, you know, speaking of ADHD, I know a lot who has that challenge and has a challenge at school. And I like that you also had given that advice to the parents because I have seen parents who at times they don't know what to do anymore. You know, like, do, do they want to give up or do, do they don't know what to do with their child because they feel like the child is challenged or just always troubled? Yeah, These are really, really great advices. Um, thank you so much for that. Yeah. Yeah. Like just to say one more thing like about that as well, like growing up, I always like just being in, in, especially in Asia too, also a little bit when I was in the US, but like, you know, just having ADHD and knowing that and just having the nurse come in, like all the kids like, oh, why is the nurse always giving those pills to Derek? Like, or, or like, you know, me struggling in school, like. I always felt like I was the dumb kid or like I was like I was never in the accelerated math classes. I was always, you know, struggling and all the all those things. But, you know, people with ADHD, people with mental health disorders can be very intelligent in a lot of other ways. And, you know, it's 
looking back, I felt like I was the dumb kid, but in reality, like those were just areas of like, like, uh, things where I were, was just not that interested in. And, you know, it might be the same for a lot of kids out there. You know, you're not dumb, you know, like it's, there's, there's so much that you're capable of. Um, and just, um, just don't be discouraged because, you know, like I said, been, been a rock bottom, been laughed at, been, you know, been the worst grades in the, in the, in the class and, you know, been to actual juvie, but ended up, you know, graduating from the best public university in the world. So it's, uh, yeah, I would just say like to all the kids out there that think you're dumb or all that, don't be, don't be down on yourself because there's greatness within everybody. And I know that sounds cheesy, but like, I would have never believed it, you know? So just keep pushing forward and you never know how things are going to play out. No, that's I agree. So there's true. I agree. Yeah. I agree. I like the last little tidbit. That thing had a lot of media into that, um, that scenario is just, again, back to the school system is they, they, it's not one size fit all. You can't stick a square peg into a round hole. It's just not, I mean, some kids, you know, excel at certain things. You're like, why are they excelling then? But you're measured by, by Johnny over here because he's in an advanced calculus and he's in in the ninth grade. You're like, okay, how come Johnny? So Johnny must be smart. He must be lucky. Everybody's just good at different things. Everybody has a different beat to the drum and you got to find your beat to that drum so that we start playing your own tune and once you play your own tune everything is much better and you stick to that right you stick to that so if you have a passion like Derek did basketball that was his focal point that he focused on that so it was like an outlet so again it's finding that outlet that will help you and like Derek did I think that would be great if you just I think there's, like what you said, everybody has that gift. So once you figure out and you find that gift, you follow that, follow that energy and you follow that passion. Yeah, exactly. Because then it can open up more other doors that you might not even be aware of. Um, so yeah, I would definitely say that, you know, for sure. Just, um, just like Ron said, you know, it's not a one size fit all. And there's no guarantee that the person in, in high school that got the perfect SAT scores, the perfect grades, there's no guarantee that person is is more successful than you are, more happier than you are, you know. So like when you get get into this nitpicking like comparisons and all that stuff, it's it's you know, it's not a productive game to play, you know. I would just say focus on on yourself, you know, have utmost confidence and belief in yourself and you know, what you can what 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 are your gifts? What can you bring to the table? And it might not be like a perfect 4.0 GPA it might not be, you know, perfect SAT scores, you know? Um, so yeah, everybody definitely has value. Certainly agree. Everybody has value. Doesn't matter where you come from. Doesn't matter who you are, skin colors or religion, you personally, whoever you are, Johnny, Billy, Sally, Ron, Derek, Gloria, you are important. I want to say thank you, Derek. And thank you out there for our audience for listening to another Life's a shuffle podcast where you share your true, authentic stories. Be yourself. Be who you were meant to be. And always, don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to listen. And if you want to be a guest, go to www. Email us at lifesashuffle.com so we can connect. Or you can check out lifesashuffle.com. Dot com. Check right. that out as well, too. Yes. And um, thanks again, Derek. Thanks for joining us today. And thank you for sharing your story to our listeners and I'm for sure um, there will be a lot out there that resonates with your story and um, and something to learn from this. Um, again, thank you um, for listening. This is Gloria, your life coach, and thank you for listening to another episode of Life's a Shuffle. <laughs>